Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. I've been meaning to tell this story and to present on this topic for some time now. Um, and it's something that I think is incredibly important in the modern world. Um, the following presentation is called The Magical Origins of Our World. And what I want to do is to illustrate how the scientific world in which we live, the world ruled by mathematics, by empirical research, by rationality, by logic, and by an essential focus upon the exterior and upon the material is rooted in something. Uh, I want to show that the scientific enterprise is rooted in something deeper and that there is a developmental history to the scientific project. Um, perhaps I need not emphasize that, that we live in the scientific world, um, but I'll, I'll point to certain things that we take for granted, certain things that perhaps we don't consider um, them being so normal. Things like the internet, which means an interconnected an inter, uh, network. That's what internet means. And it's driven by logic. It's driven by binary code. It's driven by number. The film The Matrix illustrates this with the zeros and ones. That's what the internet is. It's a mathematical system. And it's a mathematical system that is, strangely, enabling the transmission of mind to mind, the transmission of psyche to psyche. It is enabling communication through the air, through the ether. Um, somehow outside of the material substrate although computers and phones are rooted in matter the communication which is thereby enabled seems strangely um, outside of uh, a, re a reducer being reduced to purely matter we've got the internet of course which is a strange phenomenon we've got airplanes we can fly Humans don't have wings. We shouldn't be able to fly. And yet we can fly anywhere on earth within the matter of a few hours. Again, unprecedented in human history, unprecedented in the history of the world, as far as we know. Um, there are many other things which I'll get to later, but, but suffice it to say that we live in a world where whether we like it or not, science is thoroughly imbued into our, into us. Technology, the advances in technology are our world. They are a part of our world. And technology and the advances we've made in technology emerge from an, uh, a substrate of scientific philosophy, of empirical materialistic philosophy and so what i want to look at in this presentation is where did that philosophy come from how did it come to be that in the last few hundred years this explosion of learning and understanding um has has come about has come to birth how has that come to be now, I'm sure there's many explanations and many things to look at and many traditions to account for in telling this story. And I'm sure that the story I present will fail in some respects to give you a complete uh, and total vision of the history of, of science. But I'd like to look at it through a lens um, through a particular lens and I'd like to suggest the close relationship between um, 
the, the lens through which we're going to investigate this this matter and uh, and the emergence of science and hopefully um, my goal with this presentation is for you to walk away at the end having a sense of the roots of science having a sense of where it came from having a sense of the developmental tradition and the history which went into this this uh, this miraculous flourishing of knowledge and understanding and i and i use the word miraculous intentionally because from the perspective of history flight the internet and and several other technological innovations are quite frankly miraculous and it's easy to forget that living in the world we live in when it's just so normal so let's go into the story of the magical origins of our world so i've put the title up here a history of alchemy and the prisca sapientia alchemy is an old tradition which has its roots in ancient Egypt and the Prisca Sapientia is a Latin term which was strongly in the mind of a late 17th century English scientist called Isaac Newton and the Prisca Sapientia means the pristine knowledge and so Newton in his examinations of light and in, in his examination of cosmic law had in his mind the notion that the ancients the egyptians the, the the ancestors of old had in their possession a pristine knowledge a pure knowledge a perfect knowledge that they had somehow come to um, know um, what Plato would call the forms. Um, they had somehow come to know the, the, the deepest quintessence of things, the heart and the mystery of life and the cosmos. And alchemy was a, was a precursor to chemistry and chemistry grew from alchemy and so we're going to look at how this tradition of alchemy the tradition of the prisca sapientia the ancient knowledge the pristine knowledge developed from ancient egypt and once upon a time the time beyond history, the time into deep prehistory, the eternal time, the dream time of the Aborigines, the time beyond profane history, beyond linear causal temporality, a mythic time, and how the tradition begins in the myth and begins in the dream and how it moves into the historical record into 2500 BC when the great pyramids at Giza were built to so the emergence of Greek philosophy the authorship of the Corpus Hermeticum which laid the foundation for the development of alchemy through medieval Europe the Islamic Golden Age the flourishing of learning which occurred in the Arabic world, the Renaissance, the rebirth of, of the arts and the sciences, and the rebirth of ideals in, um, in the mid, in the 16th century. The Age of Enlightenment, which in many senses laid the philosophical groundwork for our modern world and modernity itself. 
so let's we're covering about i don't know what we're we covering about 4500 years of history roughly and so um i'm going to to i i may not be able to go into as much depth depth as perhaps i would like but hopefully i can give you an impression of a story and a narrative behind um the emergence of of scientific empirical consciousness in our world so let's start once upon a time and our story begins in egypt and egypt is a land shrouded in mystery um, to this day, it's not clear the meaning of the great pyramids or the temples of ancient Egypt or the mystery of the Sphinx, which is, according to mainstream thought, um, about 4,500 years old, built at around 2,500 BC. However, according to the water erosion hypothesis and the observation by geologists such as Robert Schock, the rock around the Sphinx enclosure um, demonstrates clear signs of water erosion, um, which which would have been the result of it, of um, continuous rainfall or flooding. And the thing about that is, is that Egypt is a desert and that there hasn't been a significant period of rain in Egypt since, um, well, since around um, 9,000 or 10,000 BC. This is, um, this is what the geologist Robert Schock thinks about the dating of the Sphinx. Now, I'm not sure what to make of any of that, but what I'm suggesting is that, well, what I'm highlighting simply is that Egypt is a mystery. Like, it's it's unclear to us what was going on there, and it's unclear to us what they knew exactly. We know that a lot of their culture was around, was focused around the guiding of the souls through the duat, um, which is the realm of the dead, and the ensuring of the souls um, traveling well through the afterlife. So our story starts in Egypt, and um, it starts with um, a site in really ancient Egypt. This, this site was discovered in 7,500 BC. So that's almost 10,000 years ago. And, it was this, and so this is about uh, 5,000 years before dynastic Egypt, before the time of the pharaohs, but before the time of the pyramids. Th this site was found in the Egyptian desert. And what it is, is it's an astrological site. And it, it maps the four, um, the four, the equinoxes and the solstices. And it also maps certain constellations, like the constellation of Orion. And there's a lot to be said about this, which I'm learning in um, in a series from the 90s, I think, called Magical Egypt, um, which is talking about the possibility of the Egyptian, the Egyptians having a a deep and ancient knowledge, and According to one theory, um, well, it's not a theory, it's a fact that these rocks were found to correspond to the distance 
of certain stars from the earth and so um, this is one of the sites that Nabda Playa which is the archaeological site built around 7500 7, BC and there's many different sites and the relationship between the different sites and the different stones within the sites in meters corresponds to light years um, so for each meter between the stones um, that corresponds and maps on to the distance of those stars from earth in light years in um, and light years was a measurement which was only discovered um, by us moderns about 200 years ago um, and so you can find out more about that in a series called Magical Egypt. Episode three specifically discusses Nab the Playa. And so I found that absolutely astounding to discover this, to discover that this ancient site about 10,000 years old um, mapped um, with great accuracy the distance of stars, of stellar bodies, from the earth uh, and it mapped that in a correspondence upon the earth and so this gets us to um to the heart of hermetic thought or al alchemical thought and and the old kind of esoteric saying goes um as above so below and the notion of as above so below is central to the astrological and astronomical project of looking out into the heavens and looking out into the stars and mapping the celestial above onto the terrestrial below and understanding the planes of correspondence between the heavenly bodies and the earthly bodies. So this law of correspondence or this feeling of sympathy between the heavens and the earth, this union, this conjunctio of above and below is central to what we might call magic, sympathetic magic. The idea of setting up energetic fields of correspondence here below that that sympathize with the patterns and the the heavenly bodies the gods above and so so the ancients to the ancient mind this is a, a form of invocation a form of calling upon stellar power to influence the affairs of um of humans to influence the terrestrial realm, the, the earthly realm. And so this is the site of Nabda Playa, Nabta Playa. And I've only recently learned about this and I really recommend you watching that episode because it's tremendous and it's fascinating. Um, the reason I bring it up is because it's a very old site, which I think provides us with some evidence that, that this Prisca Sapientia that Newton had in his mind, this pristine knowledge, um, was somehow held by the ancients. It was known to the ancients. Certain laws, certain insights into the cosmos were, were known to them. The pyramids at Giza postulated to correspond to the belt of Orion um, with the Sphinx, which is not in this image, looking uh, east and um, aligning to the summer solstice, I believe. Um, I think there's there's a lot of evidence um, that that the pyramids at Giza and the Sphinx that they correspond to um, astrolog astrological, um, astronomical um, 
uh, you know, locales. Um, I think the King's Chamber in the Pyramid at Giza points to True North. Um, and then, you know, the the Sphinx is, is look, gazing east. And I don't want to get too deep into that here because I'm still learning about all of that. Um, but the point is, is that this is 5,000 years after Nabda Playa. And there are signs that the pyramids in Egypt and the Sphinx are associated to astronomical knowledge. I don't know if it's astrological or astronomical, one of those, to the knowledge of the stars, to the knowledge of the heavens, and to the knowledge of, well, it's also a deep knowledge of time because after all, the equinoxes, and the solstices divide time into four and they correspond to the earth's cycle around the um on its on its axis and around the sun and so a knowledge of astronomy um permitted the ancient mind to organize terrestrial affairs to organize the affairs of the earth in accordance with um what you could say is eternal law or universal law or the laws of the cosmos and so I, and I, I i make this point again just to allude to the presence of ancient knowledge amongst our ancestors and and particularly in ancient egypt which remains to this day a great mystery to us Now, in the Egyptian pantheon, there is a deity. And this deity is um, Thoth. And Thoth was the scribe god. And Thoth, really, to the ancient Egyptians, was the originator of writing, the originator of the arts and the sciences, and all learning and really the font of all knowledge. Um, Thoth was the embodiment of wisdom, the embodiment of knowledge, the embodiment of learning. And to the mythos of the ancient Egyptians, it was Thoth who gave them knowledge. It was Thoth who bestowed upon them knowledge of the heavens and knowledge of the great mysteries of the soul. And so this is why our story begins once upon a time, because the mythos of Thoth was what the was was who the Egyptians attributed um, their knowledge to, and um, the Egyptians were were a culture existing in history who had a profound effect on other cultures and on the development of the Western world, as we are about to see. So there is a strange connection between myth and history. And so keep Thoth strongly in your mind as we go through this, because it's as though Thoth handed the Egyptians something. It's as though in the beginning of time, in the deep origins of time, Thoth bestowed wisdom upon a culture bestowed a great gift of knowledge to a culture what newton called the prisca sapientia so imagine that imagine that thoth bestowed sacred knowledge to the egyptians and so we're looking down here at the bottom the progression of thoth or the secret movement of thoth throughout history so we've jumped now about about two millennia forward and we're looking to two millennia after the building of the great pyramids at giza and we're looking at the emergence of greek philosophy and greek philosophy can clearly had an impact on the development of the Western world.
it's important to remember and to note that the cultures of Greece and Egypt were closely, uh, well, they're close geographically. Simply geographically speaking, if you look at this map, you can see that the island of Crete, the largest of Greece's islands, is not far from the coast of Egypt. Um, well, I'm sure it's relatively far, but if you look at the big picture, they're, 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 they're two, um, two cultures that are close to each other. And so we're going to look at um, the relationship now between Greece and Egypt. And we're going to look now at what happened because as dynastic Egypt faded away, Greece was in its ascendancy and the Greeks knew of the Egyptian wisdom and learned much from them. Particularly, we know that Plato, who is really the Greek philosopher, um, there is, it has been said that all of, all of Western philosophy is really a footnote to Plato. Plato said so much in his writings. He, he knew so much. He illuminated so much. He set such a paradigm that really everything since Plato, and who was writing, I think, in around 300 BC, the past two millennia have really been a footnote to Plato, a commentary on Plato. That is the tremendous impact his thought has had and what Plato contributed to us is the idea of the forms, the realm of the forms, which stands above and outside of the phenomenal realm. So we have the noumena, the noumenal realm, and phenomena, the phenomenal realm. The phenomena and the phenomenal realm are the things we can see, the appearances, that which appear to us, those perceptions which we see, we hear, you know, we, 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 that, it's the realm of appearances, it's the realm of phenomena, the things that flitter around our senses and change. And Plato postulated that beyond the realm of the senses was a realm of the numinous, the realm of the forms, or the realm of the ideas. And the realm of the ideas were like models or archetypes or blueprints um, towards which our sense impressions and our and the appearances were oriented so so if you meet a person who you think's good and you think is moral and you meet many different people who you think are good and moral then those those are appearances in the drama of your life people who you think are good and moral um and so plato would say well what do each of those people partake in? What, what quality, what idea, what form is behind them? What is it that makes us able to say that this person is a good person? Where does that quality, where does the attribution of that quality come from? And he postulated that much like the sun enables us to see things here on earth, so too does the form of the good enable us to perceive someone as a good person, for example. I'm not going to get too much into Plato's thoughts, but that's the essential paradigm he laid out. And from what I can understand, we know that Plato traveled widely in his studies. He, um, he went to, um, he went to the East and he went to Egypt and he learned from the Egyptian priests. We know of another person, a pre-Socratic philosopher, that means before the time of Socrates, Plato's mentor, who was living in around 500 BC, Pythagoras. Pythagoras was a very, very interesting, very interesting thinker. And Pythagoras too um, studied for around two decades to be permitted into the learning of the Egyptian mysteries to be imparted the wisdom of Egypt. I want to suggest to you that both Plato and Pythagoras 
touched the Prisca Sapientia. You know, this notion of Thoth giving sacred knowledge to the Egyptians. Well, I want to suggest that Plato and Pythagoras partook in that knowledge too, that they somehow transmitted and accessed that, that ancient knowledge. What was Pythagoras's contribution? Well, Pythagoras perceived that number was divine. And so he was very interested in mathematics and music because mathematics particularly, well, mathematics is the study of number and music is really the study of number in time. And so um, Pythagoras saw a divinity in number and saw a divinity in concepts like the monad, the one, or the dyad, the two, and the mystery of number and the mystery of original number and multiplicity. Um, I think that's as much to be said about Pythagoras. I suggest just researching him, going on Wikipedia and reading about him. He's a, he's a particularly fascinating thinker, and the Pythagorean theorem. Um, has has laid a foundation for for mathematics for centuries um, the point being that egypt the mother culture of the west egypt bestowed upon greece her wisdom and um these two figures in particular um were were touched directly by this wisdom and subsequently um, informed the development of our culture. And then we move the clock forward a few centuries, a few hundred years. So we had Pythagoras in 500 BC, Plato in around 300 BC. These are rough numbers, but I think they're, they're roughly accurate. Um, and now we're going to go forward to around the first century AD. So we're going forward about 400 years to 500 or 600 years. So we're looking at the first century AD to around 300 AD, which is the time in which a text emerges, a wisdom text known as the Corpus Hermeticum or the works of Hermes. The works of Hermes are attributed to an author called Hermes Trismegistus, and they are a work of, um, of Hellenistic culture, of Greek culture. And Hermes Trismegistus is a mythic figure who blends the Egyptian Thoth, who we've mentioned already, with the Greek Hermes, because the Greeks, upon their encounter with Egypt, recognized that Thoth was the same figure as their deity, Hermes. And this has to do with um, their role in communication um, because Hermes would flit between the above, the heavenly realm, and the below, the earthly realm, and transmit messages uh, in the same way um, Thoth was seen as a scribe of the gods, transmitting the divine will and putting it into writing, putting it into hieroglyphs, putting it into a message that could be understood terrestrially, could be understood on earth in the, the realm of matter. And so they both sit, sit between the worlds of the above and the below and the both are communicators essentially. The Corpus Hermeticum, perhaps we'll return to it. Um, well, yeah, we definitely will return to it as, as we go through this. But essentially, it's a wisdom text which um, contains, it's well worth reading. You can just Google Corpus Hermeticum and you can find it online or you can order the book. Um, but what does it essentially say? The Corpus Hermeticum essentially situates 
the human soul, the human psyche as a, um, as having a, a certain divine potential to, um, communicate and to, well, to, well, a certain divine potential to understand, to partake in, um, uh, gnosis, uh, knowledge, um, this this relates to plato's allegory of the cave plato thought education was a process of of liberation and plato thought of people living in ignorance people living without knowledge as being bound and chained and imprisoned in an underground cave and they would be born there and they would grow and they would look at the walls and upon the walls flitted different images, different appearances, different phenomena. And if they were not informed, if they were not um, educated in some way, then they would think that these appearances were in fact reality. They would think that is the world. This is what is. Um, but, but according to Plato's allegory of the cave, um, education is really about unchaining um, the people from the cave and um, making them aware that actually the images upon the wall of the cave are just images they are impressions they are appearances which were caused by a fire behind them which cast these images on the wall in front of them and so then they could look back at the fire and escape from the cave and they would burst then into a world um, where they could perceive the sun and the moon and the stars and they could see things in their essence they could see things as they really are uh, they could apprehend truth they could return to the realm of the forms return to the realm of the ideas and this was plato's theory of of learning of knowledge and of education and that the process of education is a process of 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 helping us to remember and recollect the original forms, the original knowledge, the original truth of things that really is the birthright and the essence of our soul and the essence of our heart. So the Corpus Hermeticum speaks in this kind of idea. It invokes two Greek word, Greek ancient Greek ideas. One is the nous, and the nous means the universal mind. And the other is the logos, and the logos is essentially um, the capacity of the individual mind to understand and to know and to learn from the nous. And so, this kind of theory of mind or theory of um, the soul is um, is particularly intriguing. And I think we and it and it is it is in a sense a philosophical blueprint for the emergence of modernity. And this was written in around 100 or 300 AD. I believe it was written in Alexandria in Egypt by Greek authors. Um, and it consists of a series of dialogues. It's, it's really worth reading. But the point is, is that it says that essentially um, human beings are divine in, in their ability to know in their ability to understand, in their ability to perceive the nous, the universal consciousness, the universal mind, um, and to articulate this through the logos. Um, and so if you think of great works of music, great works of art, great works of poetry, great discoveries in science, all of these can be thought of within this framework, within this context of interpretation, the grasping of nous, the grasping of the mind of God or something like that. And, and this seems to be something we're capable of doing as human beings through the third eye or through the eye of the mind um, to instantiate the knowledge locally in an individual mind and yet for that knowledge to partake in the universal. So it's where the individual psyche meets the universal psyche. And this is what the Corpus Hermeticum emphasizes. Um, and as I say, it's well worth understanding. The point about Hermes Trismegistus is that is another mythological um, 
allusion to the Egyptian Thoth and to the Greek Hermes. And that's right there at the beginning of the Hermetic tradition in the first century to third century AD. Here we go, the syncretism of Thoth and Hermes. And Hermes Trismegistus. We get around the third century AD, two of the earliest alchemists, again Greeks living in Alexandria, Zosimus of Panopolis, who was the first known author. I think he was an author, but I think only fragments of his works have, have survived. But um, my understanding is, is he is that one of the first people to talk about the Philosopher's Stone. And the Philosopher's Stone is a, is a mythic image in alchemy. And it, it represents immortality and it represents ultimate knowledge and the ultimate gold and the ultimate aim of the philosophical enterprise. It represents the quintessence of wisdom. It represents the rejuvenation and the regeneration of life. It represents the secret of secrets, the deepest mystery of nature. And the one who possesses the stone is said to be, it's a great mystery, the image of the philosopher's stone, you know, it's, um, but possession of it is, let's say, to possess it is to, attain a certain magical understanding and a magical relationship to nature and the world. So Zosimus is, is, is a, a Greek living in Alexandria in um, 300 AD and is the first to introduce this image to us. Maria the prophetess, um, I believe it's called an alembic, which is this instrument that Zo the image of Zo Zosimus um, has here in front of him. Um, Maria is said to be a contemporary of Zosimus and was thought to um, have invented the alembic, which is a, a, a vessel for um, experimenting chemically with the transformation of metals, which... Um, which is which, which is uh, an essential part of alchemy. So these two characters, Maria and Zosimus, give us um, start to give shape to the tradition of alchemy as early as 300 AD. The axioma Maria um, said uh, attributed to Maria the prophetess. Um, is the myst mysterious saying that from the one comes the two, from the two comes the three, and from the three comes the four, comes the fourth as the one. Um, I'm not going to go too too deep into that now. That's called the axioma, A X I O. M A Maria. If you Google that and go on Wikipedia, you can read about it. Carl Jung thought that that was essentially an allegory for the development of the soul and the development of the psyche through the individuation process, which I think, um, yeah, I think there's something to that psychologically. There are also an, a whole host of other potential applications for that phrase, the one and the two and the three and the four. These are geometric, these are numerical ideas and these relate to number, to music, to architecture and, um, and, and to the idea of beauty, which is around, around the relationship of number, the relationship of proportions and the harmony of proportions. Um, I'll leave it at that because that's a, ra that's a real rabbit hole. <laughs> Just to recap on our story so far, we started with Once Upon a Time with the mystery of Nabda Playa with 10,000 years ago roughly where there's this ancient archaeological site which seems to map in meters light years accurately. It seems to map accurately the distance of stars from this planet 
before we ever knew that we, we didn't know what light years were until the 19th century. Um, it seems to map accurately the distance of stars from this planet terrestrially in the formation of ancient stones, patterns of ancient stones on the ground. And there's more about that in episode three of Magical Egypt. So we, we start with that site and we start with the appreciation of the mystery of Egypt and the notion that the ancients had knowledge, which perhaps we don't have now, and that they had a deep knowledge and a deep insight into the cosmos, into the heavens and into the earth. And that this deep knowledge was known as the Prisca Sapientia, the pristine knowledge. And we associated the giving of that knowledge or the transmission of that knowledge with Thoth, an Egyptian deity, the giver of wisdom, the progenitor of the arts and the sciences and of writing and of the hieroglyphs and of stuff like that. Mythically, Thoth is there in the background giving birth to this culture we call Egypt, ancient Egypt. We look then at the emergence of Greek philosophy, particularly through the lens of, of Plato and of Pythagoras and how um, the Greeks were in close association to the Egyptians and that um, these thinkers learned much from them and from the culture of Egypt. And we touched also on the authorship of the Hermeticum, the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, the works of Hermes written by Hermes Trismegistus well, mythologically written by Hermes Trismegistus. Um, scholarship shows that the text of the Corpus Hermeticum was likely written by uh, Greek philosophers in Alexandria around the 1st and the 3rd centuries AD. But we're looking at this mythically because we're looking at how the wisdom of Thoth has echoed through history. Nab the Playa, the pyramids, Greek philosophy, the Corpus Hermeticum, and now the Islamic Golden Age. So al alchemy migrated east. Um, the Hermetic knowledge, the Prisca Sapientia, migrated east to the, to the, to the Arabic world. And Around the 8th century is where the 700s AD is where, where you get the beginning of the Islamic Golden Age, which was a flourishing of learning, of culture, of the arts, of the development of um, lots of different, a, a great expansion of understanding um, in the Arabic world, and we have two figures here who, who were um, some early Arabic alchemists, one called Jabir, or it was known in the Latin West as Jeba, um, and the other Rassis. Rassis, um, as I understand it, is one of the first figures in history to have distilled alcohol. So part of the study of nature part of an understanding of nature and an understanding of matter means an understanding of the processes of distillation and the the way in which the material world works and what the material world is made of um, and so we have racist to thank for alcohol and Jebba is a really important really really important figure in the history of science and is i believe said to be um the father of chemistry who who co contributed much to our understanding of chemical processes as early as the uh, late late 700s ad the 8th century and what's interesting to me about these two figures is that they're both associated with alchemy which associates them with this tradition of ancient knowledge, this tradition of the Prisca Sapientia. And they are both li living. Well, I know Jebba is definitely living 
in coincidence with the birth of the Islamic Golden Age, which lasted from 800 AD to um, 1200 AD, I believe. So, look, I'm sure many historians might disagree with me and might challenge this hypothesis, and I'm sure a lot of different things contributed to the flourishing of the Islamic Golden Age. For the context of this presentation, um, let me just highlight that I find it interesting that Jabir or Jebba, um, uh, 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 a noted alchemist, a noted hermetic philosopher who was um, partaking in the same tradition of pristine knowledge, of ancient knowledge, was there right at the beginning, right at the birth of the Islamic Golden Age, which would be, which would be several centuries of, of, um, of learning and development and expansion of understanding. So I think that's a very interesting coincidence to notice, especially from the perspective of Hermeticism, the perspective of the occult philosophy or the philosophy of ancient Egypt, which flowed to Greece, which flowed to Arabia, and now moved to England. So now we're fast, we're, we're moving through time here by several centuries. And so we've gone from the Islamic golden age and Jebba who was writing in around the late 700s AD to Albertus Magnus and Roger Bacon who were both 13th century, I believe, living in the Latin West, both living in England. Um, and both uh, situated firmly within the Christian tradition. Um, Roger Bacon, um, again, one of the early forerunners of empiricism uh, or the empirical method of, or of the rational understanding of nature, the rational study of the laws of nature, um, and again connected to the tradition of alchemy. Um, Albertus Magnus um, was the mentor of Th St. Thomas Aquinas, and again was one of the early um, alchemists in the West. These are both Englishmen who, uh, Albertus Magnus particularly, was studying Jebba and was, was, was drawing on the wisdom of the Arabs, the wisdom um, of, of the alchemists um, who, were, who were working during the Islamic Golden Age. And so um, we're starting in the mystery of Egypt. We're looking at the, the, the great wisdom that, that Egypt held. We're seeing how this then flowed to ancient Greek ancient Greece and ancient into the Greek world, into the Hellenistic world. We're looking then how that flowed to uh, Arabia, to um, the Islamic Golden Age. And now we're looking at how that flowed to um, England, to the Christian West, and to the, to the Latin, um, to the Christian Latinate world. And so that was, yeah, around the 13th century. And so now we're looking, now Italy. Now this is really, I think maybe this is mo maybe the most significant part of the whole story. It's, it's, it's definitely a significant part. So, um, so, the the Corpus Hermeticum had been written in ancient Greek, and this was um, a problem for 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 Latin speaking people. And um, what we have here is three figures who were both associated to Hermeticism, associated to the Prisca Sapientia, associated to the the ancient wisdom, and were the originators of the uh, Renaissance in Florence. 
and we have Marcelo Ficinho, Cosimo de Medici, and Pico della Mirandola. Um, Cosimo de Medici um, was on his deathbed, he was dying, and he, he for those who don't know, was um, basically the one of the wealthiest people in Renaissance Florence. He owned the Medici Bank, which financed um, a lot of the Catholic Church, and um, basically he had accumulated tremendous wealth in the mid 15th century. And under in his employment was under his patronage, we could say, was Ficinio. And Ficinio was a Christian theologian, um, but he was also interested in natural magic. And what Ficinio did was he was the first person to translate, translate, the act of translation is another thing associated to the scribe god Thoth, because it's, it's an act of translation, a moving of knowledge from from in, from an implicit state of vagueness and mystery to an explicit state of communicability. Um, anyway, Ficinio translated the Corpus Hermeticum into Latin, which was really significant because Latin was the predominant language of of Western Europe at the time. And um, Ficinio was actually underway translating the works of Plato from Greek into Latin. He was working on that as a project for Cosimo de' Medici and Cosimo was on his deathbed and he said to Ficinio when when they when they had um when um they had been bought the works of Hermes the Corpus Hermeticum from the from um a temple in um in Turkey I think it was or somewhere from um the Arabic world they'd brought in the Corpus Hermeticum and they had it there to be translated and um, Cosimo basically said to Ficinio on his deathbed, like, stop translating Plato and focus on translating the Corpus Hermeticum. <laughs> um, and the reason I emphasize that is that Plato, as I've said, was m arguably the most influential philosopher um, in the history of Western philosophy, an incredibly important thinker. And to translate his works into Latin was... And it was you know, an important cultural project. And Cosimo on his deathbed said that he valued the works of Hermes more than Plato. So this, I hope, gives you an impression of the perceived value of this ancient knowledge, this ancient wisdom, um, in the mind of Cosimo de' Medici, one of the most um, wealthy and powerful people in the, in the mid-15th in the mid, um, century. So Ficinio gets on and he translates the Corpus Hermeticum into, um, into Latin. And Pico della Mirandola was again under the patronage of the Medici. Um, I think he comes a bit later with Lorenzo, if I remember right, who was Cosimo's son. Um, and he wrote this book, um, which is called the oration on the dig on the dignity of man and basically it's a, uh, an apology for the virtues of the human soul and he was this philosopher and he basically wanted to go to the catholic church and like defend any of the propositions that he put forward and it's known as the the manifesto of the renaissance um, the oration on the dignity of man and so that's Pico's work um, and what's my emphasis here while we stick on the renaissance the renaissance was really hugely important culturally and what it marked was a paradigm shift from the power of the church and the power of an external authority and a class of priests for mediating uh, access to knowledge and learning and understanding and instead it shifted the focus the center of gravity and it fit, set, f shifted the focus upon to the individual upon to the individual human being the free creative living breathing human individual and the power of the individual and um, as i said the corpus maticum written in the first and third centuries a.d 
places emphasis on the divinity of, on the, of the individual, on the divinity of consciousness, of our ability to understand. And it kind of says like understanding is divine, like understanding the nous, understanding the forms. This is a divine capacity. And, um, you know, mankind, humans, you should wake up to this divine cap capacity. Like it's, it's really a miraculous powerful potent capacity and here in the renaissance you get a rebirthing of ancient culture of of the greek philosophy and um and roman law and things like that and it's really one of the most significant cultural paradigm shifts in history or in western history because you get a flourishing of artists like leonardo da vinci uh, Raphael, michelangelo um you get this amazing amazing um renaissance rebirth of 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 just an appreciation of beauty uh, a seeking after truth uh, uh, a noble call to being in the world and i think pico's oration on the dignity of man um um kind of articulates that philosophy very brilliantly so i really recommend reading that it's a very small piece of work and then the artists of the renaissance pretty much all of the artists of the renaissance the sculptors the painters the architects um were under the pa patronage of the medici and so the fact that one of um cosimo de, that cosimo the elder the, the father of the medici house essentially um the fact that he you know, he implored yeah, his scholar Ficino on his deathbed to say look translate the works of Hermes first they are more important the wisdom of Thoth the wisdom of Hermes Trismegistus is more important in my mind than Plato um, the fact that that happened and then the fact that we have some of the most profound um, artworks ever created and just this flourishing this flourishing of culture which we call the renaissance which i think lasted for you know lasted for like a hundred maybe 150 years or something from around you know 1420s through to like 1600 or something like that profound cultural moment really important cultural moment and what happened it was also synchronous and coincident with the pr the printing press and the reformation and the shift in values from um the church as like as like the way that souls can be saved like the the priestly class like as the way that we can that the mediators of the divine and it's a shift from that to like no the human soul is divine you partake in the divine and the way you partake in the divine is through your creativity through your understanding um, through your ability to communicate through the cultivation of your character through the cultivation of um, the human form um, and the human potential and this is called renaissance humanism and um, I mean I could go on about the renaissance I think I need to probably <laughs> finish the presentation though but um you know the renaissance laid the groundwork for things like universal values like human rights like a lot of the political and legal um impulses and insights and intuitions that we have in the modern world around the fact that everyone is partakes in something that is that everyone should be treated equally that everyone has a right to citizenship and has a right to a voice and has a right to a freedom of religion. Like these convictions that we have in the free world, which um, I think are empirically demonstrably, are demonstrably some of the best cultural forms of organization ever conceived by the human mind. The idea that, that, that the individual is sovereign, the individual is powerful, the individual should be listened to and that the individual's rights as they say in the american declaration of independence life liberty and the pursuit of happiness should be enshrined and should be made sacrosanct made understood to be sacred and to and to be protected these intuitions these political legal kind of philosophical ideas really had their roots in the renaissance and the renaissance as I'm pointing out here, had its roots in the Corpus Hermeticum. And the Corpus Hermeticum had its roots mythologically in Egypt. 
Um, and so this, all of these threads connect this notion of the Prisca Sapientia. Germany comes into the picture now. Now we're talking 16th century. Now we're looking at 1500s. Um, so we've got, you know, the printing press. We've got the Reformation going on with Martin Luther. But I want to draw your attention to a particular episode. And this is the, um, what's known as the Rosicrucian furore. Or, um, yeah, well, that... Uh, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment is a book by Francis Yates, which I'm reading at the moment, which is all about this. And it's, I've got an Englishman here and I've got two Germans and I'm going to tell you the story of Rosicrucianism briefly. So Johann Andrei was said to be the author of um, some mysterious and allegorical um, kind of poetic alchemical texts which were written in the early 17th century called the Rosicrucian Manifestos. Um, I think one of them was called The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosicruz. And um, I don't, we're covering, we've covered quite a lot in this presentation, so I don't know if I really want to get into the, the weeds of Rosicrucianism, but you should just Google Rosicrucianism. It's, it's to do with the image of the rosy cross and um, you, you know a few generations before or around the time of Andrei who wrote these manifestos in the early 17th century the early 1600s you've got John Dee um, and Michael Meyer John Dee was Queen Elizabeth I of England's um, astrologer court astrologer and um, was also um, a pioneer in navigation, so that and 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 numerology and magic, and so he was essentially a magician and a scientist, and he was straddling the worlds of magic and science as science was about to come to birth. This is a few generations before Newton, and a few and before the scientific revolution kind of properly gets going, and so you've got this really interesting figure in John Dee who is a Renaissance magician who is uh, on one hand summoning angels and on one hand um, kind of orchestrating the expansion of uh, the British Empire. So he is an important historical figure, but also an important figure in, in the tradition of, of, of um, magic and occult philosophy. Michael Meyer was the court alchemist for Rudolf um, Rudolf of Prague, and um, who was really one of the most powerful figures in um, during um, during the late 16th century. Michael Meyer was the author of Atlanta Fugiens, I think it's pronounced that way, which is an alchemical, allegorical, symbolic text. Um, and so all of these characters really are related to alchemy and uh, alchemy is is known as the hermetic arts they're related to this notion of the prisca sapientia the the ancient wisdom but more particularly what rosicrucianism is is the dream oh god it's such an interesting idea it's like the dream of a universal reformation of society through the banding together essentially of alchemists so the idea is that we've got all these people pursuing secret knowledge pursuing an understanding of beauty truth the secrets of things the laws of things the the, the deep secrets of nature these hermetic philosophers who are working in secret because they would have been persecuted by the church <laughs> And the Rosicrucian Manifesto is kind of a coded and symbolic call to those people. And it's calling this vision into being and it's saying, look, what if we pursued a universal reformation of society and a universal kind of banding together of all of our knowledge, a network of knowledge, a network of um, learning and understanding and um, collaboration and synergy 
around pulling together our understanding of nature, the above, the heavens, the psyche, the spiritual, and the below, the matter, the chemical, the material, and this unification of knowledge. What if we could unify knowledge? What if we could, um, could, could, could transform society spiritually, morally, and um, physically, and in our technology? And like, what if we could just, what if we could do that? <laughs> That's basically the Rosicrucian dream. And um, I'm simplifying, and I'm still coming to understand Rosicrucianism very very mysterious kind of topic but this is what was happening is the rosicrucian manifestos were published in germany and france i think in the early 1600s and it's they were authored by andre and they bore the bore the mark of john d's philosophy and um they are essentially a call to the unification of knowledge and the unification of a community uh, pursuing and espousing that knowledge. And so a few generations later, we, we get the birthing of the scientific revolution. We have Robert Boyle, who is another person who has been called the father of chemistry, the father of modern chemistry who was a practicing alchemist. And we have Isaac Newton, who was a practicing alchemist and was known as the father of modern physics. Newton's Principica Mathematica is thought to be the the original text um, which kind of sparked the scientific revolution in the late uh, 17th uh, century, like late 1600s. And so now with Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton, we can't, oh yeah, like what these guys did is they were instrumental. These are two alchemists, alchemists, hermetic philosophers, who had in their mind the notion of a pristine knowledge. And they founded the Royal Society, which is really uh, the paradigmatic organization for, for contemporary science, for modern science. And um, again, is instrumental in um, the distribution in, in you know the accumulation of and the distribution of scientific knowledge and so this is in a sense as far as i understand it and i'd really love to be corrected if i've got it wrong and it's a mysterious topic but this is in a sense the culmination of the rosicrucian dream of andre and john d and the birth of um science really um there's there's a lot of factors that, that that played into that historically, but one of those was definitely Rosicrucianism, and the Rosicru and Rosicrucianism was definitely associated with the origins of the Royal Society and with characters like Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton, who are both today known as scientists, but were in their day known as natural philosophers or alchemists. And so, what's all of this given us? What's what's the kind of tangible kind of output of all this that we've covered well we can fly now we don't have wings we're not birds but we can fly as i mentioned in the beginning nikola tesla drew down light itself we have light bulbs no one in human history had light bulbs you know we can light cities we can light houses we can light our cars we can light things up And light is associated with the stars and the power of the sun because the sun is the transcendental illuminator of things. And so it's like a form of magic. It's like a miracle. It's a miracle to fly. It's a miracle to harness light itself and illuminate the world around us. Um, Here's a chart from a, a website called Our World in Data, which is an amazing website. So with the data sources here, this is 1821. In the year 1821, we have a life expectancy of around 30 to 40 years. In 2019, um, in in most of the world, it's around 80 years. Was that 75, 80 years? Um, Even in Africa, where where it's the lowest, it's around, what's this? 55 to 60 years, which is still, if you compare it to 1821, it is sheerly, again, miraculous that this amount of progress 
has taken place. Um, so I'm just wanted to share a few different miracles, the miracle of flight, the miracle of light, the miracle of health, you know, um, longevity. Um, here's, here's a chart from our world in data as well. The year 1800, it, I'm just guessing here, but that's like above 80%. Let's just say 80%. So that's above 80% of the world's population is illiterate. That means they can't read and write. That means they can't, um, that they, they, there's whole vast worlds of knowledge and of understanding that they do not have access to on, on the principle of the fact that they are illiterate. That's literally the only reason. And again, again, literacy is associated with Thoth, is associated with the scribe god Thoth, the ability to write and to read and the communication through um, in, in this way, this, this manner of learning is really fundamental to, um, to, to, to education in a lot of ways. It's, it really um, you know, accelerates the transmission of information, knowledge and learning. Anyway, the year 1800, we've got 80% of the world is illiterate. And... <laughs> What's that? I'd guess that's about 16% or something. It's well, it's well lower than 20%. Well, it's, it's lower than 20%. So we've gone from 80% of the world's illiterate in 1800 to 2016, where under 20% is illiterate. Let that sink in. Like mad progress. Like, again, miraculous progress. Um, and you know the internet like what is that what is the internet who knows it was invented a few generations ago and it's just normal for us to use the internet but again interconnected network which seems to model the human brain and the neural connectivity of it is um is again a pretty miraculous achievement and you know you can make an argument a, a fair argument that most of these that no most of, all of these things are the, the outputs the products and the result of um science and empiricism which they are um but science and empiricism comes from somewhere and it comes from a certain philosophy and that philosophy is associated to the philosophy of renaissance humanism which is associated to the corpus hermeticum and 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 really um what is my point with this whole presentation <laughs> Firstly, I just wanted to share this story because I think it, it, it suggests some interesting things about where science and rationality came from, where um, our ability to generate miracles came from. And I think they really are miracles. You can look at them like, oh, like, you know, like it's just the natural thing of like what happens when you do science. Like, yeah, I guess, but like from the lens of human history, as I said, um, that level of progress is miraculous and it's a miracle um, achieved through education and achieved through the progress of knowledge and understanding and the progress of knowledge and understanding comes from a philosophical assumption that human beings human individuals can learn can grow can develop and that their potential is essentially infinite and that we can progress in our understanding and that we can come to know the truth of things we can get a grip on the essential nature of the truth and we can do things like double the life expectancy i think it's probably more than double in some areas of the world it's like miraculous achievement we can fly you know we can harness light it's like these things are just like so normal to us it's like yeah that's the modern world sam like that's just just how it is to live these days like yeah yeah it's true but there's a foundation to that there's a story to that that all of that came from somewhere and what i'm what my point is is that it came from a philosophy which essentially positions the human individual the human consciousness as divine that um and what do I mean by divine? I mean sacred, I mean sacrosanct, I mean of, of, of in, inestimable worth. It is invaluable. It is a thing to be devoted to, to be cultivated and all of that. And so I've looked at science. There's a lot I could have done on the arts. I'm actually a lot more artistically inclined and I'm much more inclined towards, you know, the humanities. And um, from a personality type perspective, I'm not 
<laughs> much of a scientist or a mathematician, to be honest. But um, my point is that is that is that how did it come to be that there is this idea that that universally that any human being is 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 were is um deeply um basically sacred and valuable from a political standpoint which is um a kind of a conviction that we have in the united kingdom and the united states and a lot of like um countries with um western values like a lot of that the idea of universal human rights like these kind of universal universalistic ideas of like human sovereignty and human value and human worth like they came from somewhere and where they came from was renaissance humanism and renaissance humanism was drawing on the corpus hermeticum this piece of old greek philosophy and the corpus hermeticum was drawing on the wisdom of egypt too and perhaps this notion of the prisca sapientia is real and perhaps Newton, who was one of the greatest scientific geniuses of all time, was onto something. He, after all, spent 80% of his time studying alchemy, and he had in his mind this notion of the pristine knowledge. And so perhaps this pristine knowledge can, in principle, be accessed by any human being. Perhaps um, if we cultivate our understanding, if we cultivate our aesthetic, if we cultivate cultivate our aesthetics cultivate our morals cultivate our um perspective perhaps who knows where that can lead and i think we're still learning where that can lead and that's a lot about what you know our current culture is doing is exploring the, the upper limits of that potential but the renaissance certainly situated the human being the human soul as as a, as an immensely powerful force you know and more than that that every human being partakes in this essence every human being is ensouled and every human being has a soul which can attain to logos to nous to understanding and um understanding that's i suppose the point of my (laughs) My presentation here is that the, the Egyptians understood something, the Greeks understood something, the the Arabs understood something, the the Italians understood something, and the Renaissance, you know, the development of history has been about understanding, and what seems to have happened is the understanding seems to have flowed out from this esoteric core of the mystery of Egypt, this Prisca Sapientia, this original pristine knowledge, and it seems to be kind of flowing out into the broader culture and um and i think the 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 great hope of education itself the great hope of learning itself is the thought that we can cultivate our understanding and we can and we can come to know um what plato called the good the true and the beautiful um and that that is within within our reach in principle each one of us um and i think that's a beautiful thought i think that 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 thought has had many years of development and hopefully i've given you an impression of that a sense of that today and yeah thought i'd try something new of this presentation um i've been researching this these topics for quite a while and so i'm really fascinated by them and i'm sure there's loads of i'm sure i must have made mistakes or left things out or uh, i'm sure i told the story imperfectly but i really wanted to illustrate just this amazing narrative of development from from ancient cultures to our modern world and i wanted to imbue the world with a kind of poetic um mythos i wanted to connect the ancient egyptian deity of thoth the wisdom giver to the flourishing of the renaissance and the birthing of the modern world um some interesting thoughts to consider um would love to hear any of your comments on this down below um 
thanks so much for listening